morning, everyone, and welcome to another Room for Discussion interview, albeit at a different location. In just two short weeks, the Netherlands and 26 other EU member states will be voting for uh, their candidates in the European Parliament elections. The big challenge for left-wing parties is to defeat the rise of the right-wing parties, as can be seen right here in the Netherlands in November, with the electoral success of the BVV. Today we are happy to welcome Bas Eikhout, Spitzenkandidat of the Greens and number one of GroenLinks BVA, and Mohamed Shaheen, number two of GroenLinks BVA. So can we have a big applause? If we take a look at the audience that you have in front of you here, it's a relatively perfect representation of your electorate because we have a young audience, highly educated, urban, from Amsterdam. So why choose to still come here and waste your time, as so to say, on an audience that will likely already vote for you? Uh, because it's not, it's not wasting your time. No, no, because I do think what is very important is that, uh, that, that we really talk about the importance of these European elections. Because probably in this room people are not even sure they are going to vote. And if they are sure, then still they need to be motivated to tell their parents and their friends and the friends of the friends to really go out and vote. So in that sense, I think every vote counts, so none of our activities is wasted. Of course. And maybe get a bit of a baseline. Who here is eligible to vote in these upcoming European elections in the Netherlands? It's quite a lot. Who here voted for GroenLinks PvdA in these past elections in November? And who will be voting in GroenLinks PvdA in the upcoming elections? Come on. Votes the <laughs> yeah. So, the 22nd of November is exactly six months ago today, and you probably don't have to explain the results of the elections that we saw then, uh, but something that you saw is that in the polls, the PVV's lead and the right-wing lead was relatively underestimated. In the polls, they were sitting at well, 25, 29, and that became 37. So, maybe Mohamed, do you think we will see a repeat of an underestimation of right-wing parties this time? An underestimation? Uh, well, I, 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 I hope not. I hope, uh, sorry. Thank you, Bas, thank you. <laughs> Let me first, if I can elaborate first a bit on the previous question, because there is this narrative that uh, photos of GroenLinks, Pevanda are only high educated, uh, living in urban uh, sites, and uh, basically the progressive bunch. And I uh, myself live in the southeast of the Netherlands, in a very small town, Helmond, in a very let's say, socially, from a social economic point of view, not the richest neighborhood. And I have to say that also there are people for the links and also there, I mean, not maybe as much as we would hope, but I really believe that those people, uh, at the end of the day, hope uh, that they will come back and vote for us the next 6th of June, because the elections are about, um, especially the next elections, are about what kind of Europe do we will get. Is it a Europe that we will try to improve and strengthen? And I think uh, something is necessary looking at geopolitics. Uh, is it a Europe where you can be yourself if you belong to a minority group or uh, if you're from an LGBTQI community? I mean, these are the elements that we, will, that we want to uh, uh, put on the table. The other side, will those parties like Wilders or Le Pen or the Alternative for Deutschland where they openly state that they want to weaken Europe from within. Weaken from uh, Europe from within. Uh, sorry, my voice is a bit... Uh, Too much weak. campaigning. It's not campaigning, I was in Toschelling, and uh, <laughs> the weather was beautiful, but that, that evening I, I, I got a cold, a cold. Uh, my apologies. So, uh, the, 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 the parties like uh, the PVV or Arte de for Deutschland or the party of Le Pen, that openly are stating that they want to weaken Europe, and we know their ties with, with China, their ties with Russia. And I think this is something we really want to uh, make sure will not happen. I think that's very important, and unfortunately, what we see in the Netherlands is something that we hope won't see in Europe, is that middle parties, like the VVD, make coalitions with these right extreme parties, because at the end of the day, that's what they are. So you cannot, on the one hand, say that you're pro-European, want to work on a stronger Europe that's necessary to also work for peace and stability in the world, and at the same time, in, in the Netherlands, work with these anti-democratic, anti-European parties. That's, my, uh, uh, that's what I hope we can, uh, we can block on the 6th of June. To, we'll come back to that point about the uh, center shifting to the right in a, in a moment, but first we'll talk about who you are. 
We have an interesting combination here. Just like in the last election, Khun Links and Bay Fada are participating with one list. But eventually, half the elected candidates will join the Greens, like you, boss. Yep. And the other half will join the Socialists and Democrats, like, like you, Mohammed. Yes. What distinguishes you from one another that you end up in these uh, family groupings? I mean, <laughs> maybe I can give a start of an answer yep. and then you can, can continue. I, what I tell my friends and family, because I understand that politics is sometimes quite complicated, and I think it doesn't have to be simple. What we say, what we pledge to everyone is that we are one group. We will have one spokesperson on every topic. We are for links pay for that. And, in, and we have one political program that had a strong support coming from both political parties on the conference that we had recently. What we pledge, what we promise everyone is that we will work as one group and we will make sure that that program will as much as possible be implemented. And how do we get there? We always look at being as effective as possible. We think we can have a strong, we can have strong support for that program through two political groups. So we are one team working as one uh, uh, political family, but we are influencing two political groups in the European Parliament. Because at the end of the day, it's about the votes and it's about the, uh, the number of votes you can get in Parliament. And what we did in the last four and a half years, five years, is actually work in a similar way and now we're formalizing it a bit. So one program, one team, and two political families to make sure that our program becomes reality. I think that's a bit, uh, if you ask the differences between the two of us, it is limited. We are pretty close. In the Netherlands I do think that Greens and Social Democrats have really moved closer and closer to each other. Uh, the, the good example is five years ago, we always have in the Netherlands these kind of voting tests and then you have to fill it out and then you are being helped on which party to vote. There were 30 uh, questions being asked and then afterwards it turned out that both PvdA, so the Social Democrats as us, had given 30 the same answers. So they even had to invent a new proposition in order to find the difference between the two of us. This was five years ago. So basically what we want to do is strengthen the cooperation of progressive parties in Europe that we are doing in the Netherlands by joining the same list. Uh, I think that's also clear to the, to the voters with the same program. However, indeed in Europe, they're not yet the same uh, list. You never know what will happen in the future, but at this moment, there are differences between Social Democrats and Greens at the European level. And what we're doing is using our influence in both political groups. Of course, some people then say, why do you not choose between one of the two? Why are you not going to the Greens or the Social Democrats? I think that would be stupid, because to be very honest, we are quite influential in both political groups, and we would like to maintain that. Otherwise, you are throwing away your influence in one of the two political groups. So like this, we're having the same program, we will work together, we will work together on this cooperation, but we will use our influence in both political groups at the Europe. Not, not, not the best one-liner, we are very well aware, but that's, that's a bit the difference between a national context and a, and a European context. I mean, I, I spoke to someone from Poland, there the Greens are on the same list with someone from the Christian Democrats. I mean, that's, that's I would say, even more uh, interesting to explain. So, so, so we are one group trying to influence two political groups and to try to unite them. There are, are there are, I think, four political groups in the Netherlands that will join one group and their goal is to make sure that that group is as divided as possible. I can guarantee you that. I mean, that's something They will that's, be successful in that. They will be probably successful in that. I mean, if you look at the Christian Democrats in the Netherlands, I mean, there are four, four political groups that probably will join the European People, People's Party, and they are way more divided when it comes to many political topics than we are uh, looking at the Greens and the Social Democrats combined. I mean, that's also, I think, something... Uh, that is happening on a political, on a European level. And that's something I think we are also looking at because at the end of the day, we need united pro-European forces and we need political forces from the middle to choose whether they are pro-Europe or want to work with the Greens and Social Democrats to strengthen Europe or it's the same political forces that are joining the People's Party, the European People's Party, that want to weaken Europe and want to join forces with the extreme right. And that's something that we at least want to, uh, well, not block, but at least have an alternative to that. 
Boss, at the beginning of this month, you uh, expressed shock at the Ursula von der Leyen statements at the Maastricht debate uh, about opening the door to forming a coalition with parties from the European Conservatives and Reformists. Why does she draw a distinction between the European Conservatives and Reformists and identity and democracy? Do you think they should be painted with the same brush parties in these two political uh, Absolute groupings? Yes, no. Uh, I mean, uh, so Ursula von der Leyen from the Christian Democrats is trying to pretend that you have the far right, that's the identity and democracy group. Uh, there you have Le Pen, there you have Wilders once he uh, has a seat in the European Parliament again. Uh, and there you have Alternative für Deutschland, for example. Uh, and, and then you have this, this European con uh, Conservatives and Reformists. But there you have the Vox party from Spain, who is saying that, you know, the best days of Spain were under Franco. Okay, um, interesting statement. Uh, you have there Zemmour, which I would say in France, I, I really, I do not know what's worse, Le Pen or Zemmour. Uh, you have the PIS party, the Polish PIS party, who von der Leyen herself was freezing funds to Poland because of the PIS party, and now she's pretending, no, but the ECR is okay to work with. I mean, it's totally ridiculous. And by the way, they are themselves more and more merging. Last weekend in Madrid, they had a huge meeting where they were showing the strength of the far right and invited there were Le Pen, Meloni, it was organized by Vox, they were celebrating Trump and it was all ECR and ID together. So I think for Van der Leyen, it's becoming more and more complicated and, and to be very honest, nonsense to distinguish between these two political groups we are very clear, we are not going to cooperate with either of these two parties. And by the way, that's now also a promise of the European Greens and the European Social Democrats. So there you already see that Greens and Social Democrats are exactly on the same line also at the European level. So what we saw last week is the publication of the Dutch New Coalition Accord also led by a coalition. Yeah, you're not allowed to call it a coalition accord yet. Not yet, not yet. It's a concept coalition. No, no. Trying to get somewhere. With the PVV, the BVB, NSA and the PVD. And your response there was that this was a matter of scapegoat politics, putting the blame on the wrong people. And the analysis that we got you know, the day after showed that a lot of these were likely to be struck down on a European level simply because they did not take the limitations on an EU level into consideration. Mohamed, what do you think it says that these parties don't necessarily seem to work these European limitations into their plans? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a bit of a frustration, I think, for me. Eh? You know, that, uh, if you look at the concept, uh, coalition accord or whatever they call it it, it, it relies a lot on the flexibility that Europe is willing to show. By the way, the flexibility that the Netherlands never is willing to show. Because at the same time, they want budget cuts, they want to reform many uh, legislations, and uh, they want to have another derogation and another... <coughs> I mean, I don't think that's something that will play well in the Netherlands. Not even with the parties that they belong to from a European family perspective. I don't see the European People's Party accepting uh, 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 budget cuts uh, from the Netherlands. I don't see the... Uh, giving the farmers a derogation uh, and the, at the same time creating a, a competitive disadvantage to other farmers in the EU. I don't, I don't see that happening at all. So it's a lot of promising promises, but uh, not a lot of... I, think, I mean, in a couple of months, uh, when, I, when the elections will be finalized and the new commission will be uh, 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 presented, I think that it will be very clear that all these uh, hopes and desires from the Dutch possible Dutch coalition will uh, will not be uh, will not be uh, will not will never see that will never be granted. I I, I really maybe boss you have a, another perspective there, but I, I really believe that there's no way that and taking away uh, finances from the from the EU and demanding changes to a lot of legislation that other countries already have implemented. I don't see that happening. But it's, it's super cynical, eh, what they're doing. It's really, it's super cynical because they know what they're putting on the table there is impossible to achieve, but they know that, but they can already know that later on they can blame Europe. Maybe some judges will have to say something, they can blame the judges. Uh, it's, it's already, the disappointment is built in this new agreement. 
and any populist like Wilders is already of course thinking ahead and knows afterwards I can just blame others for not achieving this and it's really uh, it's what Mohamed saying that if you really want to achieve something because that's important for Europe um, it's not true people who are saying nothing is possible in Europe that's nonsense of course if you go to Europe and you say hey this is really complicated for us so could you help us out I mean there are people sitting in Europe in Brussels right these are not machines so they are willing to listen to you. But if you go to Europe and you say, we want to opt out on migration, we don't like anything on migration with Europe, we want anything on nature and we're not going to comply with any of the standards on, on our manure shit. And by the way, we are going to give less money to Europe and we hate you. By the way, can you help us? What do you think the answer will be? And they know it damn well. This is super cynical politics and, and this is what you get when you are colliding with, with people like Wilders. It's, it's a shit show. All of these parties ran on a relatively anti-EU uh, platform, as you yep. mentioned. So, of course, here the timing is interesting that we are right in the middle of these coalition negotiations with the European elections coming up. Do you think they have an uh, incentive to drag out the, the formation until we have these new results so they can push it a bit more? Well, I think the biggest problem is for the VVD, eh? so the Dutch Liberals. We are now in the situation that we are, have a potential government where the VVD is probably the most pro-European party in the future government. I mean, how low can you go? But that's a bit where we are uh, at the moment. And they are now in a coalition with three parties that really have difficulties in looking beyond borders. Uh, you have the Farmers' Party, who hates Brussels, but by the way, gets a lot of money from Brussels. But that's okay, of course. Uh, then you have this Omtzigt guy, well, the only thing he's interested in is budget discipline, budget discipline. Uh, I, think, I think he's worse than the German liberals on budget discipline. And then you have Wilders, who is a nationalist uh, and only interested in Europe to blow up Europe. And then you have the VVD, and this is fascinating, that's where Mohamed started with. We now have the head of list of the European VVD saying, working with the far right is a danger for European democracy. I think I agree with that statement. But I find it rather complicated if he's making that statement and then meanwhile saying, yeah, but for the Netherlands it's different. So apparently the Dutch democracy is not as important as the European democracy for the VVD. I can imagine that they wouldn't mind if this drags on a bit longer than until the European elections, absolutely. For the others, I don't think they give a shit. We've spoken quite a bit about the minutiae of the legal implications and the negotiation uh, process, but we got to talk about the politics of it as well. Um, we had Simon Hicks here, the political science, on these couches a few months ago, where he reiterated his claim that the June elections will result in a significant rightward shift. What is the enduring appeal of such politics? I mean, there are two elements that I want to discuss. First of all, what you see now is that even if there's a shift to the right, they have one element that they always surprise me with that, that their egos are very big. They are, they are never united. You already now see that the pen is breaking with AFD. The There's always a reason to have a fight with, within the extreme right. And at the end of the day, <coughs> they also never take responsibility. You know, they never say, you know, sign legislation. Uh, we've seen it in the last four and a half years as well, that the Christian Democrats have tried sometimes to form coalitions with the far right on specific legislation. And they were able to water down individual amendments. But at the end of the uh, day, when they need to say yes to the legislation, they walk away. So I think this is something we need to be aware of. But the fact that the extreme right is rising in Europe, that's a fact. I mean, and I hope that people see that it's very important to vote the 6th of June. Because giving away Europe to the extreme right means breaking down Europe breaking down you know, rights that we have fought for for generations to get there. And everywhere where the extreme right is taking power, people rights are, 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 are being are taken away. And I always tell people, ask the women in Poland, ask the unions in Finland, ask LGBTQI parents in Italy. I can go on and on and on. And the crazy thing is, is that the extreme right never has a majority of themselves. They're always facilitated by the middle, by people that are indifferent 
and are maybe not affected by the legislation changes that the extreme right is imposing. People like Malik that says, well, in the Dutch content... That's the head of Islam. Uh, sorry, sorry. I like him, that's why I say Malik. And, and I feel for him. I really feel for them because many people of the Dutch liberals come to me and say that they feel really discomfort with this relation that they now have. And I always tell them, I don't have the luxury to just say this is discomfort and walk away and continue this relation with the extreme right. Because I know that it will, will affect people that I know close to me, friends of mine, people that look like me, LGBTQIs, minorities, judges, uh, journalists. It's not an experiment that we can take all over the expense of people. That's something that really, really... <coughs> so yes, they will maybe gain some strength, but without the middle, they can never be in power. And the bigger the left becomes, the bigger progressive forces are, the more effective the alternative it starts to uh, exist for the middle. Because we cannot be the excuse for them to go away and form a coalition with the extreme right. Not in the Netherlands and especially not in Europe. Now, we, you spoke about uh, Renew Europe's condemnation of going into a coalition with right wing parties of the VVD. And there's also been proposals now to put the VVD's membership within the Renew Party to a vote, but it's unlikely to actually uh, go anywhere. So, also, what do you think will be a turning point in this middle far right coalition? Uh, well, I think, I, I mean, um, um, what is going to be interesting, of course, I mean, the elections still need to happen, right? So there's still no vote cast uh, for the European election. So, so every seat has to be given yet. So let's not pretend uh, everything is already lost. Um, we are in the middle of a campaign, and let's be very honest, the far right is going down in polls quite a lot. So if you compare it to a couple of months ago, the closer we get to the European elections, people do realize that maybe it sounds nice, it feels nice to vote them, and that's a bit your question, was it as well, right? For what's their appeal? I think their biggest appeal is that they are anti-system. So there's a lot of people who lost faith and trust in politics, and they managed to be the bit of the outsider. Although, if you look at the political mainstream, they have been very influential in changing the debate. Think of refugees, how people are now talking about refugees. That is really a far-right narrative that I think uh, far-right has been very successful in winning. But still, they manage to be the outsider. So if you is want that to a failure then on your part to yeah, reclaim also, the narrative? This is, this is also partly where you need to be self-reflective as a, as, a, as a progressive party, where it's kind of, okay, somehow, uh, and certainly for the Greens, we have never been in power, but it seems that everything is happening in the Netherlands is because of us. It's fascinating. Uh, and, and there, I do think that, that maybe we also, as progressive parties, have sometimes been you know, too, too shy in pushing back to that. And I would say not being vocal enough. And this is also what we're doing this campaign. We are much more vocal, much more ag aggressive, you could say, to really make clear where we stand. Because you know, progressive parties have always been ch asking for fighting the system, changing the system. And now suddenly they pretend on the far right that that's their call. So I think here you also need to be self-reflective uh, as a politician and not only, you know, blame others. Of course you have a role in that to play. Um, but I think, and that's back to your question on the coalition, the future coalition, I think what is going to be very clear that this far right will not have a majority. They will not have a majority. So it boils down what is the centre going to do. And this is why it's important that already the Greens and Social Democrats have said we will not in any way work with the far right and that's everything to the right of the Christian Democrats. The Liberals are split, that's always, they're always split. Uh, so the French now basically also said we really cannot work with the far right but you're absolutely right and the Liberals, they have split minds on this. Uh, so I'm not sure how they will decide on it. But it is very clear that the majority of the Liberals will also not work with the far right, whether the VVD will be part of that, or maybe the VVD members of parliament will not get any lead position in the Liberal group. That can also be a, be a kind of a punishment. But there are no red lines to cross anymore. I mean, For the VVD. This is, if this is not 
a line where you state that uh, as a liberal, this is, goes too far, we're not part of our political family. And let me be very frank, as social democrats, we had the social democrats joining a coalition in Slovakia. Our response was, you are not a social democrat anymore. We kicked them out of our political group. I mean, and, and I feel very sorry for all the Greens and, and also for, for, for Boss because the moment we joined you know, uh, our, our, let's say our ranks and uh, became one, effectively one political group in the Netherlands is the moment that they have been seen as, as, as the systems party, but they have never been in government. It's people like me that have been in government, although I've never yeah, been you, in government you need myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to apologize for some of the legislation that my party effectively put on place. Uh, and, and I think we, we really have seen we've done, what we've done wrongly in the past and we want to change it. But when it comes to the middle, when it comes to political groups, well, well, let's say parties from our political family, joining coalitions or creating coalitions with the far rights, that's the moment that they cannot be part of your political family. As we did to the party in Slovakia, <coughs> we said, this is a line you've crossed, you cannot be part of our political group anymore. What lines do the favorite day have to cross to, uh, uh, to have some consequences? I mean, this is the craziness. You cannot say this is a boundary, and then when the point, that, that point is met, shift it a bit. I mean, that's when people say, I don't have trust in politicians and in political parties anymore. So this my advice would be very clear. You cannot say they cannot be part of our group and then come back to it and not appoint them to a certain position anymore. I think that's too weak. You're a, if you're a liberal, you're a liberal, and you cannot join forces with anti-liberal, anti-democratic parties. If you speak about presenting a unified front on the left, um, Danish Social Democrats, for example, they were among the first center-left parties to adopt quite hostile positions on migration, running contrary to your stated party's platform. What are the challenges there? Can you then run a unified campaign on the European level? I have a lot of discussions with my... With my uh, colleagues from Denmark uh, and, and some of the ideas that they have on migration. I think they, are been, they have been debated and discussed many times also within our party. I think they form a very minority, but uh, as far as I, I mean, and, and again, debate within a party is fine. Having a debate on migration is, I think, healthy. The problem is the moment that you start Victim, if you start to uh, blame game, you know, if you start to scapegoat, if you start to associate that, if you start to dehumanize people, say that, you know, these migrants are uh, a threat to our society, are a threat to our women, you know, these are the moments where I say uh, uh, this, this doesn't belong to, uh, to, uh, 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 to, to, to my political family. But having a discussion on, you know, Migration policies, uh, understanding. I mean, we have the same discussions as well in our party, where we, for example, now state that you know seasonal labor, where people come in the Netherlands, work in very, let's say, um, harsh conditions, uh, as basically in, in 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 sectors where one of the political parties, the baby is very active, agriculture, uh, logistics, uh, you know. Is that the type of migration that we want to support? Is that the type of, are we willing to continue having these low uh, paid people uh, that are being used by the system, misused, and misused by the system definitely? Um, is that the type of migration that we want to see? That's a debate that we have. And, and for us, I think that we really think that less labor migration for those sectors could be something that we want to uh, Put forward, but dehumanizing people is not something that we would ever accept from any of our political parties. I think moving on. Okay, I think then we have time for some audience questions. Let's see, we have someone with a microphone. If you have a question, I think they're in the middle. The microphone coming back up. Sorry. 
thanks so much for ready that I'm also coughing, so it's not just you. Ah. Um, yeah, I have a question about uh, your work uh, after the elections, actually. And this is based on uh, Buzz's experience as a rapporteur on the CO2 emission uh, for heavy duty vehicles. And you saw there that Germany walked away many times uh, from the negotiating tables with things apart. And it made me wonder how do you look as MEPs as at the reliability of the council as a negotiation partner in the next mandate? Things will not get easier, difficult decisions have to be made. Is the council a reliable negotiation partner in your next term? We have an expert here. We have an expert. <laughs> um, um, no, you're absolutely right. You know, if, if we want to make policies at the European level, you need parliament and a majority of member states. Um, and it will become more and more complicated. I mean, in the end, Germany agreed with it. Huh? So this was also a big battle within the German coalition, and this was mainly the FDP, you know, the, the, the German liberals, who, uh, by the way, what was most fascinating on this one is that when the FDP was doing this, I got all the German heavy-duty vehicle manufacturers coming to me, could you please make this law pass? And I was like, well, tell that to your own fucking liberals, you know? They pretend to speak on your behalf, and no one was happy with what they were doing. So here you see that it's, it's politics and not contents taking over more and more in different countries. And it's true that if we want to build majorities for new laws, then there's one thing, what we're fighting for, to have a majority in the European Parliament. But the next step is indeed also, how can we get legislation through the Council? I still think the majority is, is reasonable. And, and the FDP, well, to be very honest, are you German or? No, okay, no, to, because this Does he look German? No, but since it was so much in heavy duty vehicles, you know. So, um, uh, Germany has this very strange coalition agreement that they say if one of the parties doesn't agree with the European law, Germany is obliged to abstain, which gives a very important country in Europe, the biggest, a kind of a position that they are abstaining a lot on a lot of policies. It's terrible to get any law through then, of course, if this would happen in all the countries, because if all the countries abstain, there's no majority. So I do think we need a discussion with different member states. I would say with this new coalition treaty, forget about the Netherlands, on Italy we also already have our doubts. So it is getting tight, absolutely, but, but probably, and that's the good thing, these elections are of course also really about the future of Europe and you see that debate also in countries like France and Germany. And for example in Germany the mood is changing at least. So AfD is going down, you see that, that, that socialists and Greens are, are steadily climbing up a bit. So I do have trust that Germany in the end will, will be back at the European table. Uh, but you never know with the Liberals there. Also there, it's the Liberals, it's always the Liberals. To continue this conversation, unless you want to yeah, respond just to this question, to say something particular. because there's this song that you know I, I listened to Which a lot the last last <laughs> couple of weeks. And this is a song of when I my, my, my it's from the Dijk. It's a uh, man weet pas wat die missed a man only missed what he uh, what, when she's not there anymore. It's a song that my my, my I have a eight year old older brother who was in a band. And uh, I used to sneak in his room and take uh, his CDs. And uh, this was one of the CDs that I listened to. I think it was a song from 1999. <coughs> it really reminds me of Europe. Because Europe, especially because of the extreme right, every member state is not seeing the added value of Europe anymore. We all negotiate from our own Dutch or Danish or, or French perspective, this nationalistic view. You know. The value chain of companies do not stop at the border. It doesn't stop at Venlo. We are the front land or they are our uh, uh, foreland when it comes to economics. When it comes to culture, you know, we, in the summer we all go to all these beautiful music festivals all over Europe. I think one of the key elements that we need to try to awaken again is this idea that the added value of becoming, of being Europe, the added value of working together. Because if you don't see the added value, then it boils down to that specific heavy duty vehicle manufacturer in Aker who maybe will lose a couple of jobs instead of looking at the many other jobs that will be created 
because this legislation and many other files that we are working on are creating the new industrial base of Europe. And yes, we'll go at the expense of a couple, but hopefully it will create new uh, companies and new jobs. Maybe in Poland, maybe in the Netherlands, maybe in Germany, but at the end of the day, good industry in one country will help sectors and industry in other countries. This feeling that we are one Europe, that we can work together and be stronger, is something that has somehow, you know, almost is slipping out of our hands. And that feeling has to come back again, because you will only miss what you don't have if it's gone. I mean, this rhetoric is very ambitious, very lofty. Um, I can, I can if, if you speak about the, the, the policies behind this, yes. right, the broader green industrial policy that, that you've been involved with as a rapporteur for the development of the CBAM, the yeah. Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. It seems to blend the goal of increasing growth while decreasing emissions. Is trying to do both not really doing either particular well? But it is possible. <coughs> I mean, the facts are in the em em empirical evidence. We have decreased through the emission trading system our emissions by more than 20% while those sectors have increased by 60%. What, what, what I see is, take, take CO2 standards for, for cars. You know, or again, through the half day, we are opening up this, this back door of having synthetic fuels. You know, let's keep on going as we are going. Let's hope the small diesels and the small petrol cars will maybe uh, still be produced in the future. You know, we have been surpassed significantly by one Chinese manufacturer, Build Your Dreams. They produce more electric cars than all European manufacturers altogether. And the same holds for Tesla. And we are still holding on to this idea that, oh, we need to make sure that Mercedes and Volvo are in the best uh, 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 position to still continue producing. Volvo is partly Chinese. Uh, uh, Lincoln Co. has become Chinese. Uh, I mean, I can go on. I mean, uh, MG, a former British brand, has become Chinese. These brands will exist. Mercedes will exist. Ferrari will exist. But if we don't innovate fast enough, those brands will be in the hands of bigger players that did invest in the value chain, in the ecosystems of this new technology. And if we don't see that, if we don't see that the carbon border adjustment mechanism is a way forward to make sure that innovation and, and decarbonization is supported, is incentivized, instead of seeing it as a way to increase costs. I mean, other countries are doing it themselves. There's a Republican in the US, um, uh, I, I have to think about his name, but he wrote a, a, an act, a Republican, not a Democrat, a Republican. It's called the Foreign Pollution Act. If you can Google it, you can give me his name again. Um, the Foreign Pollution Act is SIBA. Basically, I was in his office. He was telling me I was inspired by SIBA because, you know, uh, I don't mind you having SIBA as long as the Chinese are affected uh, more uh, significant than us then we're okay with it. And by the way, this act that we're introducing is to make sure that the, uh, uh, the what is the investment program again in the US? Higher. The Inflation Reduction Program uh, Act is, is the protects, uh, uh, that our producers are protected by unfair competition coming from higher polluting countries. So what I want to say is that other regions in the world are not behind us anymore when it comes to ambition. If you look at it from a factual point of view, actually we are l lagging behind. There's a gap between us and China and the US. And now the question is not whether we are ambitious enough. The question is, can we close this gap? Can we make sure that our industry can be in the same position as American and Chinese industries? <coughs> There's a race going on. And if we don't smell the coffee and wake up, at the end of the day, the biggest threat against deindustrialization is not bus uh, bus out to Muhammad Jain. No, it's the fact that we are not ambitious enough and the fact that we are not investing enough to make sure that these companies can decarbonize. But you're right that, that the next part of the Green Deal, and this is also why these elections will also determine the future of the Green Deal. So here again you have conservative politicians who are saying, Green Deal, let's take a pause, let's take a break, we're not going to work on it anymore. 
And that would be the stupidest mistake to make, to now say, okay, we're not going to continue with the Green Deal because this is the only way to, to really, as Europe, be attractive for investors if we are doing green technology. But you're absolutely right that, that for now we have been focusing the Green Deal very much on, on climate and energy. What the next step is, the Green Deal has always said, that by 2050, we don't own, only want to be climate neutral, we also want to be fully circular, and we want to have a zero pollution economy. And this really, of course, means that we need to think much better of how to be circular in our resources, because Europe is poor in its own resources, so we need to invest that. And therefore, now the wasting economy we're having, where you get resources out of mines, you make something out of it, and then you throw it away, that kind of linear wasting production uh, system will have to change. Otherwise, we are not going to meet the climate targets and we will never be fully circular. So Europe really now also has to take steps on this circular economy, and that will have consequences, of course, also on your economic growth model. So we have to, we have to work on these kind of concepts also in the follow-up of the Green Deal. But for now, the political fight is really, do we have majorities to continue that Green Deal? That's now the battle we need for these elections in order to be capable of doing these kind of programs also after June. I think we are getting towards the end of the interview. Before we do that, we want to also link uh, what's happening in your party between you know, the UVA. In the past two weeks, I think everyone in the audience is familiar with the climate of the UVA, and inevitably you are too. And if you look at uh, your party, one of the internal conflicts that you have is also how to respond to the situation in Israel and Palestine. So, do you think there is a similarity between the division that you see in your party and the division that's being created at the UVA right now on this issue? I think, I think uh, what the similarity is, is that some people are trying to uh, pretend there is a big difference and, and, and in the protest they are trying to pretend that these are all violent anti-Semitic people, whereas what the point is that a majority, both in our party as in the protest, people are really upset what's going on in Israel. And really, there is no division in our party on that. Where there might be a division is on some kind of, okay, what does that mean for our final solutions? And there, of course, you can have a discussion on how to go in that direction. But if you look at judging what the problem is and how the response of Israel is really, really something that we as Europe should be much more forcefully act upon, I mean, also in our party, it's very clear, we are asking to suspend the association accord with Israel. That is something that our party is asking for. The Dutch government is totally not there yet. Uh, now also, we want to debate on what happened yesterday, uh, Monday it was, on the International Criminal Court, where they are now, rightfully so, also saying there are wars of crimes with Hamas, but there are also wars of crimes by the Israeli government, and Netanyahu is responsible for that. So we want to debate on that. What does that mean now for the Dutch attitude towards Israel? When is ne the Netherlands finally going to change its attitude? Because Rutte has said the invasion of Rafa is a red line, and now we are in a semantic discussion whether it's an invasion or not. There, our party is very united on action there. And it's the same with the protests. They are very clear anti Netanyahu and what Israel is doing. I think we have a very wasted public discussion where I would say the far right is trying to, to really make the divisions within our party. So that's why they, every time when we are saying we blame Netanyahu or you're anti Semitic, you know, we are also every time blamed that we have a huge anti Semitic problem in our party. It's total nonsense. Total nonsense. And that's the same for the majority of the protests that we saw. They are having anger, and rightfully so, with what Israel is doing. And that is what we should have. I think there are some extreme elements. They, they misused it, and they got all the attention. And it's the far right trying to pretend that that's a symbol for everyone. And I think we need to make sure that that is not possible, because otherwise we are only struggling with, uh, with that, Whereas the main message should still be, we have a big problem what the Israeli government is doing. And I think there's no division there. 
The far right and the, the right parties were known to be opinionated on the protests that were happening at the UFA, and on the other hand, it wasn't the left parties that were necessarily reacting in a similar strong language. So do you think that was a conscious choice to be a bit more wary of trying to get involved in this situation? Because of course they were making the link between this protest and anti-Semitism and other similar links. So what makes left parties more wary? Using strong wording? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it becomes at a certain moment a contest, okay, when, when should it be stronger or not stronger? Uh, uh, that's, that's also, I do think that what I would say every time when people are uh, making comments about it, and I think this, for example, also, I mean, in a week time, as far as I know, Femke Halsema will come here, right? So in a week time, uh, I think she was also very clear on Dutch television. And you will have an interesting discussion with her, but she was also very clear, the majority protesting here are not anti-Semitic. We should never fall in that trap. I think that was a very strong statement. Um, does it need to be stronger? Does it need, I, I, I'm not so sure that we have to go in that direction. I think we need to be very clear on the majority of the protesters, what they're aiming for. And I think that is a bit lost in the public debate, and that is true. But I think we push back on that clearly. But, it, but it, is, it is quite frustrating that you know you have to have statements that uh, you're not anti-Semitic and uh, to have to explain that and everyone that rallying. Is yeah, you get that shit on Twitter as well. I, I get. I mean, I have to. You know, I, I, I grew up in a society where uh, whatever something happened, I had to uh, make a bold statement that I'm against it. Uh, you know, uh, people ask me, "What's uh, what's your opinion on 7 October?" Uh, what do you think about ISIS? What do you think about Al Qaeda? You know, as if there's this. Ooh, maybe you could be one of them as well. It's very annoying to live and grow up in the Netherlands for the last 20 years. Have to apologize and have to <coughs> give statements on things that you're not at all. If you're a Democrat, if you're uh, at all associated with, or I mean, it's strange that you first have to make a statement before they can listen to your opinion. But what annoys me, annoys me a lot, is the lack of empathy to Palestinians, to life, to people. You know, there's a big discussion on a slogan that's been used that I would never use because if my Jewish friends tell me that they feel threatened by that slogan, I won't use it. And, and that's who I am. I'm a progressive person. If people tell me that they're insulted by that slogan, I don't use it. It's very simple for me. You know, I have, as I said, many uh, friends. Um, um, but the fact that there's a discussion about that slogan, not about the fact that Israel is basically implementing that slogan, is something that really annoys me. The fact that we have a discussion about the demonstrations here in Amsterdam, instead of having a demonstration about the number of people that are being bombed. I have two young children, and I try not to be involved in this debate because I really get emotional. Because I, every child that I see, also on October 7th, I see my child's face in it. And, and I really think, like, if I was the, if I was the father, and one of my children would, would have been bombed or killed or killed by Hamas or bombed by Israel, how would that, how would I feel? And how would I look at the debates in Europe where people basically don't feel sorry for you at all, almost don't feel any empathy and sympathy? That's, if you really care about peace in Israel, if you really care about live, two countries living side to side in peace, act on it. Make sure that the Palestinians can have their own state and live in peace next to Israel, next to Israelis. I want to support the thousands of Israelis that, that, that demonstrate against Netanyahu every day. Those are the people that I sympathize with. And the Palestinians that for the last 15 years in Gaza have lived under a Hamas rule without anyone caring about them. I want them to be free. I want them to live in a democratic state. And I don't want to have a debate on who said what in, in what demonstration and would you please give a statement from your political party that you're against that. I mean, that's really, it, you know, it takes the focus away from the goal and the goal should be help those people. Because if we don't help them, I can guarantee you, there will be an invasion in five years, and then another one in ten years, and then another one. And how do we think that the Palestinians will get out of that? I mean, this is what saddens me. 
and how many people need to die before right-wing politicians understand that having peace and prosperity is in the benefit also of all the Israelis that really want to live in peace with the Palestinians. And whatever you do, whatever you say, my advice is please check how that affects that goal. Does it bring that goal closer or not? Or does it <coughs> take away sympathy from some people that, uh, um, that uh, maybe we need at the end of the day to have a majority in favor of peace? We want to close off this interview with uh, a quote by Macron. Uh, he gave a speech at Sorbonne University last month where he said the following. He said, we must be lucid about the fact that our Europe today is mortal, it can die, it can die, and that depends solely on our choices, but those choices have to be made now. To close off, do you have a damning warning for us along those lines? <laughs> Yeah, although first of all, always uh, don't always fall for the nice words of Macron because he's usually acting differently than what he's saying, but that's, that's, uh, that's on a side note. No, I do think that uh, these European elections really will define the future of Europe for the, for the rest of this decade, and this is a pivotal decade also for the position of Europe, of Europe in the world, uh, basically for the rest of this century. So in that sense, these European elections cannot be underestimated the importance of. And that's also why I started with, it's great if you're all going out to vote, but really make sure that you are also convincing people around you, your friends and your family, to also go out and vote. Because it will determine the future of Europe, and it's basically a very simple choice to be made. Do you want to vote parties that want a stronger Europe, that wants to deliver on the future of climate, nature, social security policies, or are you going to vote for right-wing parties that want a divided and a fragmented and a weak Europe that will not stand in the world? And that's, that's really the simple choice we are having the 6th of June. Vote with your conscience, vote whatever you want, but really think of this future of Europe that's at stake and it will determine our security, our future green policies, our future social policies, that's at stake. So I think in that sense Macron's absolutely right, but then afterwards he's doing whoop uh, whoop. That's Macron. Uh, we try to also act according to the words we use. On this question of security policy, you said on uh, the news buffet that you had been naive about the realities of warfare on our continent. Two years ago, yes. And now the party platform advocates for an increase of defense uh, spending. Would you call those people who disagree with you now naive? Um, Do they still exist? Nah, it's, it's, it's always easier to say about yourself that you're naive than to blame others. So I keep it always to myself. I think like many of us, we thought that kind of the old-fashioned way of warfare is not happening anymore in this continent. There's a lot of security threats, not only through warfare, right? It's also through, through, uh, through social media, through technology, um, through our energy dependence. We have never been naive in warning for our energy dependence of Russia. There it was us fighting against the conservatives. So it would be nice if the conservatives sometimes would also agree that they have been naive in other parts. But it's true, uh, we always thought, okay, we can do some less spending. We change that because what we're seeing now is that there is a regime to the east of us that is willing to really do an old-fashioned warfare attacking Europe uh, and really Ukraine is Europe and we, if we say we will always stand by Ukraine then we also need to change our policies on that. So I think we've showed that we can change and that we can indeed have now this in our program. If you would have asked me five years ago would we write this in a program, I would probably have said no. Now I'm proud we're doing that, because I do think politicians also should be capable of showing that they can adapt to new circumstances, and admit it then also, if you make mistakes. And we're converging, you know, see, the parties are continuously converging. Well, isn't it, isn't it? <laughs> maybe for you to close it off, you also agree yeah. with the notion that the EU is more or maybe a message of yeah, optimism? Me, I, I don't quote Macron. <laughs> 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 But, you know, for me, the most important thing is that we are Europe. Europe is not an invisible hand that, you know, takes the decision uh, that uh, we don't have any influence on. We are Europe. So if it dies, 
basically part of us will die. And we should not let Le Pen, Zemmour, Wilders that will Maybe. make Europe weaker. Because if it dies, then probably we have killed it. And for me, uh, it's about making sure that we get our industry uh, shaken and up and ready to make sure that the new jobs we create are green jobs, to make sure that human rights are at the core of Europe, and that we are as much as possible uh, aware that we should not only practice what we preach, but also make sure that this hypocrisy uh, that exists within Europe goes away. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't rely on the US when it comes to our own defense system, uh, that we have a seat at the table when it comes to having debates with these big geopolitical powers. And Europe is our pathway towards that. We don't have an alternative. It's the only thing we have. Let's cherish it, and let's make it stronger, not weaker. But, but, but really, this I just want to say. Our demo I know we're on time, but, but our democracy is being attacked also from within the inside, right? So it's not only the outside, it's the inside. And Europe needs to stand for its own rule of law, its own democracy. What's happening in Hungary, yes. where we are seeing that civil society is basically just kicked out of the country, that is where other countries are slowly on the road towards. Italy is already further down with discrimination of minorities and the Netherlands with this new government is basically now on page one of Orban's rule book. And we as Europe need to stand for our own democracy and that's also at stake on the 6th of June. And on that sober note, we've come to the end of today's interview. Thank you, boss. Thank you, Mohammed, for joining us uh, here today. The coming two weeks, I'm sure, will be eventful for you too. Thank you to you all for joining us uh, this morning. And uh, you a call to vote. Of course, keep these things in mind when you vote. <laughs> Self-evident to go to the polls on the 6th of June, of course. Our next interview room for discussion will be on the 11th of June with the CEO of A22 Sports, the Super League. That is going to be interesting. And apart from that, uh, I wish you a good day and a last applause for our two years.